Hello, everyone. I'm super excited to be here with you, um, all, I guess, 10,000 of you here at ProductCon Online 2024. I think this is my third or fourth time participating in ProductCon uh, in some capacity. And I swear the, the agenda gets better and better every time. So I really hope you're catching all the amazing sessions that they're offering. So let's jump in with a quick introduction. I am Stephanie J. Neal. Uh, a product person who has almost 20 years of uh, product management experience, um, building high-performing teams, scaling products across some of the internet's biggest brands, such as Stripe, Amazon, Twitch, New York Times, Lionsgate, Interactive Core, um, otherwise known as IAC, uh, as well as a stint in federal government, where I served with the United States Digital Service, if you haven't heard of them, check them out, usds.gov. And if you would like to connect with me, I am Stephanie L pretty much everywhere. So the last name is hard to spell, but hopefully it's easy to remember, Stephanie L. <laughs> um, okay, before we jump in, I do want to let you know what I'm here to talk to you about today. And it is the past year's hottest topic, artificial intelligence. Before I begin, I'm going to say what we're going to cover, um, what we're not going to cover, and who this uh, presentation is really intended for um, so that you know if you're in the right place at the right time. So the main questions that I hear from PM leaders around machine learning in particular um, is really sort of around like, what is the strategic use of ML? Or like, how do I strategically use ML for my products? Um, what's the business value that they can drive? Um, you know, how do I think about ROI? Uh, and moving it forward, uh, moving products forward with ML, um, and then some and technical questions, I'd say. Like, that's sort of the bucket of questions that I get mostly from product leaders, and we'll touch on those today. Um, there's a whole other bucket around, like, ethics and regulations, like team talent, team composition, all that stuff. We're not going to talk about that today, um, so they'll be out of scope, but they're equally important. Um, it is also worth noting this presentation is less for the few folks who've been in the AI space for the past like five, six years. Um, and it's really more for the boom time product leaders um, who find themselves now being asked uh, ad nauseum from execs, what about AI? <laughs> and of course, I have to hit my meme uh, uh, quota for this uh, presentation. So I saw this one a year ago, actually, on LinkedIn. I thought it was really funny. Um, and and kind of true. And uh, and you know what? Here we are today. And I, I still think it's funny and kind of true. Um, so I'll say I, I don't consider myself uh, an AI expert. I'm just a seasoned product leader who's led teams uh, that have done work with ML um, for personalization. And I want to share that and the learnings that the teams have, have derived with you all today. Um, and I think it is very applicable especially with this space just continuing to heat up and get more exciting. All right, so I think definitions are extremely important um, so that we always start with the same understanding. So what is AI and what does the artificial landscape, artificial in <laughs> intelligence landscape look like these days? Uh, as you probably know, AI is an umbrella term that covers a ton of rapidly changing acronyms and algorithms. So it includes stuff like ML, uh, machine learning, nat natural language processing, computer vision, and more. And then within each of these, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, many AI systems actually incorporate multiple techniques and capabilities, and there's just a ton of overlap. And you know, uh, M uh, AI research and development is ongoing, so there's constantly new stuff emerging as well. Um, but for now, like, here's a little high-level overview of the most prominent concepts and techniques. Um, so we have LLMs, uh, large language models, probably very familiar with ChatGPT um, and its competitors. Um, and, you know, we're seeing a lot of development in that space right now. Um, that is limited media, so it's effectively just language. Um, and then there's, like, generative AI or GAI, um, which is more broad and inclusive. Um, and it can generate things like artwork and videos and songs and all that fun stuff. Um, so if, I don't know if you guys remember, but I think like the actors in Hollywood were striking about this like a year ago. Maybe they still are. I don't even know. 
Um, and then ML, machine learning, I think that's probably the most like um, most leveraged, um, at least historically. Um, but it's still hamstrung often. I think a lot of companies struggle, um, you know, having having good quality data um, to really train the models and 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 effectively um, apply it. Um, and then AGI or GAI, strong AI, human level AI. I think it has all these names. Um, also known as the scary version of AI. Like when you think of um, what was it, Ter Terminator, um, where Skynet like becomes sentient and all that. And I think that's th this is the category of AI. Uh, and let me just say, this is like very speculative and no one knows where it's going or how it's going to change our world. Um, so your guess is, is literally as good as anyone else's. Um, and I actually think it's a pretty fun exercise and product vision to, to sit and think about all the, all the ways the world can change um, based on this, this type of intelligence. Again, though, today we're going to focus on machine learning which I see as the most currently the most practical and underutilized um, version um, and how it's going to help you drive, you know, insights and drive it, impact for your products, um, for your company's products. Before we move on, though, I do want to give a shout out uh, to AI ethics and people who work in that space, given it's such a, an evolved, a quickly evolving space with so much potential to change how we live. Um, baking and understanding and baking in ethics early is so, so critical to avoid outcomes that none of us want to see, um, including, you know, um, prejudice and um, uh, increasingly bad outcomes uh, for, for vulnerable parties. So just shout out to everyone who's working in that space. You're amazing. All right. So zooming in a bit on machine learning uh, and why machine learning matters for PMs. So uh, it is most effective for driving impact across these three use cases um, or categories, if you will. So improving customer experience, largely through personalization, uh, optimizing operations, largely by making quick decisions on, um, uh, you know, on areas where it doesn't really need human intervention. Um, so what we all want in, in any process is humans doing the human things and computers doing the things that computers are great at. Um, so it's sort of like looking for those pieces um, and op um, automating processes for efficiency. Um, and then, of course, creating new revenue streams, um, which is obviously a hot topic pretty much everywhere these days, um, a renewed hot topic, perhaps. Um, these often will show up through dynamic pricing um, or, you know, uh, improving fraud heuristics um, uh, such that you're not you know, losing money um, through fraudulent means. And um, and of course, targeted marketing um, is another valuable one. So what matters for ML a lot, I guess, actually, um, at the end of the day, you know, driving impact is all about knowing your customer um, and knowing your decision types and uh, knowing that what you're putting into your models is quality enough that it's going to, what it puts out is going to be quality enough. Um, and you're going to have to have measures in place for that. Um, so, yeah, uh, different segments. It, basically, this is sort of like PM 101, right? Like, know who you're building for and know what their needs are, and you need to design that from the outset. Um, and then what I mean by know your decision types, data-driven versus data-informed, in some cases, um, being data-driven is a good thing, meaning like machines can make these decisions for you, and that's actually optimal. Like, we don't want humans having to think about it. Um, but in other cases, you still want, uh, like sort of a, a human, a human input and human decisions, but like ML can help, uh, help that human make a better decision, um, based off of their unique needs. So it's really, you can think about it, um, over sort of like a control point, right? It's sort of at what point would the human choose to control versus, uh, you know, give control to the machine. Um, and then, of course, for Geico, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Um, as they say, data is the product manager's language, and well-groomed big data is the lifeblood of all AI. So you need to make sure that um, you know you're providing the right data sets. The data is of a certain quality, um, and 
that there's feedback loops that allow your models to continuously learn um, and learn well. So that is all a part of the design as well. And the playbook. So um, this is a somewhat standard playbook. Um, so I'm actually just gonna kind of emphasize the first three here. Um, basically, these are the first three that you never, you wanna make sure they never get overlooked. And you as a PM really are, you know, owning this aspect the most. Um, so one, start with a real user need. Don't lead with the technology, right? Uh, I've, I've seen a number of times, you know, uh, machine learning becomes this hammer in search of a nail. Um, and actually a colleague of mine once, uh, once said, uh, you know, people, people, I think you meant PMs, <laughs> people think they can just sprinkle some personalization on a feature um, and it'll magically work and be like that much more powerful. Um, but no, and I'm actually, when I get to the case study, you'll hear um, about how, uh, you know, sprinkling um, personalization on a feature doesn't work. Um, uh, and uh, two, you got to have clear objectives. If you don't know the outcome that you're seeking to drive for your business, you're never going to get there, right? Um, and three, bring in design. This is like really critical. I feel like a lot of um, activities, uh, a lot of activities in the in the uh, AI space, they really over index on engineers, uh, ML engineers and such. And they don't consider the fact that um, design needs to be there from the beginning to make sure that whatever powerful solution that you're designing, it's actually accessible and usable um, and desirable to the end user. Um, because again, you can you can sink a lot of investment into a feature, and if if it doesn't if it doesn't work for the user, then you just you just wasted a lot of effort. Um, so you need that baked in from the beginning. Design should be at the table, understanding the what and the why just as deeply as your engineers. Um, and yes, of course, you also need to understand the fundamentals of AI and machine learning, such as like the common algorithms, data requirements, data management. Um, overall workflow, you know, all that stuff um, for model development and deployment and feedback loops and all that. Um, but, you know, not at the expense of these really basic and, and critical fundamental PM needs uh, or PM activities that you do for every product. All right, the stages of ML personalization. So um, this brings me to the key insight that um, our ML PM i oh, sorry, our ML personalization engineering teams actually derived, so credit to them. Um, I found this concept really helpful in how I thought about building um, ML personalization features um, and products. And so I wanna share it with you all and hopefully it helps as well. Um, and the important thing to remember when you're building ML products, you need to be iterative, you need to test your assumptions on the value. Um, and, and evaluate the ROI, ROI as you go, because it can get really expensive and heavy. You need to make sure it's worth it to go all the way. Um, so the three stages, uh, uniform experience, everybody gets the same experience, zero dimensions, like zero personalization, personal dimensions, heuristic personalization. So having a set of rules, uh, an experience chosen by a handwritten set of rules. So it has to be manageable. So a few dimensions that will parse people into groups or part, you know, make decisions, right? Um, and of course, the third, uh, machine learning driven personalization. Um, and now this can have, uh, uh, basically the rules are augmented or replaced with machine learning and it can do it um, a, a much broader array and it can be much more pers highly personalized and faster, right? Um, but of course, the investment is very different across these groups. And so you need to consider the trade-offs of each stage. So uniform experience, these are most features on the internet. In fact, like even search used to be the same, right? For everybody, uh, you type in a string and you would get the same results. That's obviously not true today um, because they uh, it has gotten much, much smarter. Um, and it is now a machine learning driven personalized feature. Um, for trust and safety and fraud, that is also uh, very true. Um, although I'll say uh, fraud detection is still, can still largely um, be uh, heuristically driven um, just with a certain set of rules. 
Um, it doesn't always need to go all the way into machine learning driven. Um, and I guess an example, maybe, um, so today payment type defaults and language settings are actually determined by geo. So that's a heuristic segmentation. Um, but of course there could be a future, right? Where payment types are being ML driven at some point. Um, just again, taking more burden uh, off of the user because your payment um, your payment types don't change that much. Um, your preferred payment types likely don't change that much. Um, whereas like your country location might. Um, and like language also wouldn't change that much, right? So the stages of ML. Um, again, you have to think through the trade-offs. So the experience, user experience goes from less control. Uh, so as you give up control, you also give up cognitive load. So you want to think from a user perspective, again, have your designers with you. From a user perspective, where is that value? Um, at what point is, is it worth giving up, uh, giving up that manual control in order to uh, also relieve yourself of cognitive load? Um, you have to think about the fact that the behavior is dynamic versus static. Obviously, uniform experience is more static um, and machine learning can be highly dynamic. Is there unique value in that? Um, and as PM, you have to be doing the ROI um, and thinking through, like, is this worth? Uh, sure, it's like marginally better. Is it that much better for us to be investing this heavily um, on this specific feature? And to be clear, so both approaches are appropriate for different situations. One is not better for the uh, than the other, and they can be combined. Um, uh, as in, actually, in this case study, um, aka a cautionary tale um, that I will now share with you. So uh, this use case uh, comes from the ML personalization team at Twitch, and um, it was an experience. You know, uh, it was an experience that that we went through and we learned from. Um, basically, it underscored the importance of designing a feature with ML in mind from the start um, versus just going in with uniform and not not taking into consideration uh, not taking into consideration how much um, personalization can improve the feature for the people you're building for. So again, it's really important to have designers in the room, and it's really important to have to craft a product vision of what you think the best end state of this feature is going to be. So uh, jumping in, in 2020, we built and launched a feature called Hype Train. For those who don't know, um, Twitch is a live streaming site um, that is uh, creator centric, um, and then uh, the creators have communities. And then there are features that Twitch offers that help uh, enhance effectively the experience um, uh, for the community, engaging with um, and, and, and watching um, the, the creator as they, as they effectively perform um, and entertain. So um, Hype Train, in a nutshell, um, is when uh, basically viewers start supporting the streamer monetarily by subscribing or gifting subscriptions to the channel, which is a big event. It's very hype and very fun. Um, and if you've never seen it happen, you should go to Twitch and, and, and try it yourself. It's extremely exciting. Um, anyway, so if people are subscribing and then more people to that you spend tends to get spend, and so more people start doing it, um, it'll start to kick off a timer. So the more support events uh, help the community as a whole, and it unlocks basically a higher level um, and it's sort of like, you know, the train and, you, you know, if people keep um, contributing, then you unlock the next level. And as you get through the levels and, and it ultimately culminates with emotes being unlocked, um, which is exciting because that's uh, the language of the communities on Twitch. So we have this feature um, and we based it off of user behavior that we saw in the wild. We saw it occurring naturally in channels. Um, um, I forgot the original name. I don't think it was Hype Train. It was like Hype Bomb or I don't know, something along those lines. Um, and so out of the gate, it was, I guess, in its nature, a uniform experience in the wild. Um, but even when we built it in 2020, it was also a uniform uh, experience and it was designed as such because I don't even think we had actually an ML team at that time. 
So personalizing this feature wasn't even a glimmer in our eye, and we didn't consider it. Um, it started out with hype trains being triggered by these simple rules um, that were man configured manually by creators. So the kickoff threshold, the difficulty, and the cooldown. We noticed that although our channels vary greatly in size, in content, in engagement, so like we have people with cooking shows, we have video gamers, um, we have people speak, you know, teaching languages, um, we have like just chill, chill communities that just kind of hang together um, and, and, and talk about the day. Um, so it's, it's really different. Um, but we saw that very few creators actually were going in and adjusting the settings um, of these different rules, basically, um, which we had offered. Something like 90% actually had never touched them. So what are the odds that we got this correct, like optimally correct for 90%, right? Like the length of the cooldown, um, the, the level of difficulty, the, you know, the threshold for uh, the train to start, like, how, like what, what are the odds? Like pretty much none. So we believed if we could introduce some personalization based on, you know, the, the, um, uh, the attributes of the channel, and uh, configure it automatically with machine learning, then we could uh, improve the experience for everyone um, and ultimately yield streamers um, you know, higher income. So uh, our, our plan was to test this hypothesis um, with, an, with a contextual bandit that would adjust the settings, basically like wiggle the knobs, um, the control knobs, to find the optimal configurations for each channel over time. So it wouldn't be like a sudden thing. Uh, it's a pretty good plan, right? We should ship it. Well, it turns out when you give control to users and then you take it away, uh, that can be problematic, um, especially when it has, it can impact uh, income uh, and especially when you have a chance of getting it wrong. So um, we had to, uh, hype train configuration started out as simple, transparent, and under con user control. Um, but again, personalization in its very nature is not is not any really any of those things. Um, although I guess it could be transparent. So we had to come up with a plan B, or the team came up with a plan B, I should say, that leveraged the heuristic box um, rather than jumping straight into ML personalization. So instead of um, swapping out the change for existing streamers, we added an optional autopilot checkbox um, into, the U <laughs> into the UI so they could manually go and say, OK, you guys can configure this for me to optimize it. Um, but for new monetizing streamers, we did make it um, um, opt out. So it was like automatically checked for them, and they would have to go and uncheck it, so the opposite. Um, this is low investment, but it's a super, super slow burn. And it is still, you know, to this day, I think after a few quarters, we were still under 10% of adoption. Um, so it just made it that much harder to move toward that ML personalized model, which I, I think we as product managers would argue was obviously like the ideal end state, um, but we didn't consider it from the beginning. So it made it more challenging to get there. And from this, we've learned a few lessons. Um, so, you know, not every feature requires machine learning. Um, uh, is, or it's not all destined for machine learning. Um, so evaluate from the beginning and then really, you know, test your way through with phases. Um, and then, you know, start with a uniform feature, validate, um, incorporate, you know, rules and heuristic, other heuristics, um, and, uh, and then get to apply machine learning when and if you are ready um, to keep the, the ROI, you know, penciling out along the way. And, um, you know, really, again, start from the beginning thinking, like, will we ultimately want to take this control or to, for users to not have to worry about this? Um, and if the answer is yes, you have to design it uh, in a way where you can do that elegantly as you go. Um, so you don't, you know, end up in the, in the hype train situation uh, with that slow burn. Um, and I just want to really encourage you all um, to lean into and explore uh, machine learning as a strategic tool in your tool belt, because it can be super powerful when applied correctly. Um, and, you know, 
AI in general is just such a fascinating space. And, um, you know, we all, we all need to lean in and uh, figure out how it's helping us today and how it can help us in the future. Um, and I think it's exciting that it's so nascent in its development, uh, certain aspects of it, because it's anybody's game. Um, you don't, like, there's no one who knows the future. Um, and I just want to remind you all that in case anyone's feeling a sense of imposter syndrome around it. So, yeah, thank you all so much uh, for coming to my talk today. Um, please reach out. Again, I'm Stephanie L pretty much everywhere. Um, and I hope you are loving your product con online 2024. Thanks again.